Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I make it midday by my watch. So um, before we start, could one of the attendees just write in the chat box whether or not you can hear me and then we will get started. That would be great. Thank you. not had any responses yet so if you can hear me if someone could just pop that in the chat box that would be appreciated That's great. Thank you very much to those who just um, posted in the chat box. So my name is Gemma Callow. I am the communications manager for the Brumbury's programme leading on stakeholder engagement. I'm joined by my colleague Peter Edwards, um, who's the principal clean air zone officer leading particularly on exemptions. So what we're going to do is just give you a quick overview of the clean air zone how it's going to operate, um, what support's available. If you have any questions during the course of this presentation, if you could please pop them in the chat box and what we'll do is we'll answer them all for you at the end. So I'm just going to start the presentation now. OK. So the clean air zone, the reason that the clean air zone is being introduced is because we have dangerously high levels of air pollution in Birmingham. Um, a con uh, currently, it's contributing to over 900 deaths in Birmingham every year. There's a lot of stats on the screen. I won't talk you through all of them, but you can see it's contributing to conditions such as heart disease, diabetes, asthma, cancer. Children are adversely affected. They are closer to the ground, closer to those exhaust fumes, and they inhale three times as much air pollution as we do as adults, which has a detrimental impact on their development and growth. So air pollution has been declared a national health emergency and the government as such has instructed councils across the UK to be introduced in clean air zones. Birmingham will be the second, but they will be coming up across cities across the UK. So in Birmingham, um, pre-COVID, um, we knew that we undertook some research that showed 50% of journeys into the city centre were undertaken by car. Of those journeys, 250,000 every day were less than a mile. So that's a 20 minute walk. What we're trying to do with the clean air zone is get those high polluting vehicles off the road, but also get people to consider alternative ways of travel, be it walking, cycling or public transport, particularly for those journeys that are less than one mile. So Birmingham's clean air zone will go live on the 1st of June this year. It has been delayed a couple of times, but it is going live on the 1st of June this year. And we are introducing a category D clean air zone. So as I've mentioned, there'll be clean air zones all across the country. Ours is category D. It's important to stress that a clean air zone is not the same as a congestion charge. So the congestion charge in London charges every vehicle to enter through that particular area. Ours will only charge the most high polluting. So because it's a category D, it means we will charge the most high polluting buses, taxis, lorries, vans and private cars. So the clean air zone, it will be everywhere on your screen. You can see there that's blue. So everywhere within the A4540 middleway, but not the middleway itself. So you can drive around that middleway, no problems at all. But if you're in a non-compliant vehicle and enter the zone, you'll be subject to a daily charge from the 1st of June. So if you're in a compliant vehicle, it's important to stress that you don't need to take any action other than consider alternative ways of travel. But if you're in a non-compliant vehicle, you'll be subject to a charge of £8 a day if that's a car, taxi or van and £50 a day for HGVs, coaches and buses. A day is midnight to midnight, not 24 hours from when you enter the zone. And so and during that midnight to midnight, you can drive in and out of the zone as many times as you want for a single charge. It's important to stress, though, if you do cross that midnight threshold, so drive in at 10 p.m., leave at 2 a.m., you will be subject to two charges because you've crossed that threshold. 
When it comes to paying, um, the government are setting up a national payment system, um, which will be available online and over the phone. We will publish those details on the Brumbreeze website once that's confirmed. But you'll be able to pay six days prior to the day you go in, the day that you go in and six days after. So that's a 13 day payment window. If you don't, you'll be subject to a fixed penalty notice of £120. Um, that will be reduced to £60 if paid within two weeks. It's important to stress that the emphasis and the onus will be on you as a driver to know that you've entered the zone and on you as a driver to make payment. So it'll be the same as London. You won't get a text or a letter to say you've entered the zone and you owe money. We are installing over 300 signs around the perimeter of the zone to warn you you're approaching a charging area. And if you enter, the responsibility is on you to make sure you make those payments in time. So what is a compliant vehicle? What is a high polluting vehicle? So if you go onto the Brumbreeze website, you can click on the link to the government vehicle checker, which allows you to enter your vehicle registration details and it will tell you whether or not you'll be subject to those charges. But vehicles that won't be charged are Euro 4 standard or better. So this information is in your V5C logbook. So a Euro 4 standard or better petrol vehicle. So that's most vehicles from 2006 onwards. Please note that timeline is a guidance. It's not it's not the date that it's important. It's the Euro standard. A Euro 6 diesel vehicle. So that's most from September 2015 onwards. And then gas Euro 6, fully electric, fully hydrogen fuel cell and hydro, hy, oh, excuse me, hybrid electric vehicles that meet the, that Euro 4, Euro 6 standard mentioned previously. Like I say, the easiest thing to do is go on the Brumbreeze website and check your vehicle details using the government vehicle registration checker. So despite the myths and some misreporting, the clean air zone is not designed to be a money making initiative for the council. If we make no money from this clean air zone, then we've achieved our objective because that means there will be no high polluting vehicles passing through the zone and therefore the air quality will have improved. However, we know we will make some money from this, so we have to invest that money in transport related projects and policies. We cannot use it to fund the bin collections or repair the floozy and the jacuzzi, anything like that. It has to support transport related projects and policies such as those on screen. So uh, we've already provided some funding for a hydrogen bus pilot. It will go towards city centre pedestrianisation and uh, active travel networks, so bicycle lanes to encourage people to walk and cycle more to make it safer for people to do so. And also we'll be funding controlled parking zones on the border of the A4540 middleway to stop people parking their vehicles and walking across to protect those residents from that happening. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Peter. He will talk you through the support that's available. And again, if you have any questions, pop them in the chat box and we will um, answer them at the end. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Yeah, my name is Peter Edwards, Principal Clean Air Zone Officer within the Clean Air Zone team. I have overall responsibility for delivery of the exemptions side of the programme. Um, so just to set in some perspective, the exemptions, um, we know that, uh, well, Gemma's already detailed why we need a clean air zone. Um, we've been mandated to do it by government. So back in 2018, we conducted a consultation. That consultation uh, received 11,000 responses, the, the, the biggest response Birmingham City Council has ever had. But that consultation was not um, should we do a clean air zone? We have to do a clean air zone. Um, we, we are mandated to do so and, and it's a public health emergency. It was more to identify who uh, should be supported, should be given the most support um, when the clean air zone goes live because we know this is a this is a big deal. This is difficult for people to adapt to um, economically and in their behaviour. So off the back of that, we've come up with a suite of um, exemptions and financial support packages to help people that were identified as part of that consultation. So the first thing that comes is the exemptions. Those are available to apply for now and are on screen. Um, so if you live in the clean air zone, you can access an exemption for up to two years. If you work in the clean air zone and you earn less than £30,000 a year, plus you work for more than 18 hours a week in the zone, so you can't just work with like a, a Saturday shift in the zone, then you would potentially be eligible for a one, a one year exemption from clean air zone charging. 
if you run a business in the clean air zone, so your vehicles that are registered within the clean air zone, uh, you can also access a one year exemption. And then, of course, we have uh, the Children's Hospital and two other medical centres within the zone that offer uh, emergency or out of hours services. They will uh, visitors, patients to those centres will also be able to access uh, an exemption that will be done via a voucher system whereby you will collect a physical voucher from from the reception uh, from the, the medical centre and you will credit that on a system that is being developed at the moment and will be released. Um, before the zone goes live. All of the other ones you can see on screen, residents, commercial uh, workers, they are all available on our website now to apply. It's a very simple process. You create an account, um, tell us which one you want, where you work, where you live. Um, and then in the second stage of the process, you simply need to give us some details about your vehicle. And then critically, of course, we need to see some eligibility, some proof of that eligibility. So we'll need to see the vehicle certificate. If you live in the zone, we need to see something that proves that you live in the zone. As, uh, equally, we need to see something that proves that you work in the zone and earn less than that figure. So if you think you're eligible, the, the key message here is please go and apply now. Um, and unless you apply, you are not exempt. Even if you meet those criteria on screen, unless you tell us and you prove it to us and we grant you the exemption, when June the 1st comes, you drive a non-compliant vehicle into the zone, then, then you would be charged. So please go to the website, as Gemma says, check your vehicle, that's the key. But then secondly, if you think you're eligible, please apply as soon as possible. Um, next slide, please, Gemma. In addition to those, um, what I call kind of applicable uh, exemptions, public facing exemptions. There's also um, a range of others that are shown on screen here. So it's important to note that having a blue badge does not give you an exemption from clean air zone charging. However, if you are uh, if you have disabled passenger tax class on your vehicle, this is on, listed on your V5 and can be accessed um, via the DVLA if you're in receipt of certain disability benefits, then that tax classification gives you an automatic national exemption from all clean air zones so that's London uh, Bath that comes on uh, their London low emission zone ultra low emission zone Bath's clean air zone that comes online uh, next month in March and then ours in June so if you think you may be eligible for that check your V5C and, and check the, uh, the the DVLA and the .gov website motorcycles are exempt uh, historic vehicles so that's vehicles over 40 years old uh, specialist vehicles so we're talking about emergency services recovery vehicles showman's vehicles so that's the vehicles that are kind of used to, to deliver fairgrounds they're quite niche vehicles these not big numbers and then finally um, community and school transports so that's your kind of ring and ride services these these that you see on screen here have a kind of um, a, an ongoing exemption it's not time limited you move me along please Gemma so we've already talked about the exemptions and, and the way I see the exemptions is they give people breathing space. Um, they allow you some time where you're not paying the charges if you have this compliant vehicle, uh, non-compliant vehicle, sorry, to, to, to think about what you're going to do. Are you going to upgrade your vehicle? Are you going to switch to public transport? Are you going to begin cycling to work? That gives you some breathing room. What you see on screen here is the, the financial incentives package that we've secured from central government. Um, as this is the overview to this session is for everyone, I will go into them in some detail. So apologies if some of this isn't relevant to you. So if you work in the zone, we have a £10 million um, scrappage scheme that will come online before the zone has gone live. We're going through the procurement process at the moment, whereby if you meet the criteria, which will be almost identical to the criteria for, for the exemptions category, um, but will have their own terms and conditions. So less than £30,000 a year, non-compliant vehicle, work in the zone for 18 hours a week. Um, you will be able to apply to scrap that vehicle, that non-compliant vehicle, and in exchange for scrapping that non-compliant vehicle, we will be able to offer you either £2,000 towards a compliant vehicle or £2,000 uh, on in a mobility credit. So that will be used on a, on a Swift card with Transport for West Midlands, so available to use across all public transport in the West Midlands area. So this scheme is not live yet, but will be soon. Um, if you think that you might be eligible and you're interested, so you can apply for the exemption now. And you, but if you think specifically, yes, I want to scrap my car and take advantage of this scheme, then you can sign up for a, a monthly newsletter on our website. And of course, as soon as we are ready to go live with that scheme, 
um, you will be able to, you will be first to, to, to find out. We then have um, a scheme to available for SMEs, so small and medium enterprises in the West Midlands for coaches and uh, HGVs and coaches. So if you run a fleet and you have large vehicles that are non-compliant, these vehicles will be subject to a £50 a day charge. But We have a £10 million pot of money to help upgrade or retrofit those vehicles. There is a section again on our website all about this. This scheme is open for application at the moment. Um, and finally, um, Birmingham licensed taxi drivers, so that's hackney carriage and private hire drivers, can access funding um, in, a, in a number of different schemes to suit their needs, um, whereby they can upgrade to a compliant vehicle, a hybrid vehicle, an ultra low emission hackney carriage vehicle. And as of this week, there is a new scheme for up to £5,000 to replace a hackney carriage with a with a Euro, a Euro 6 diesel um, vehicle. So you will start to see, and we've already had, I think, 1,200 approximately uh, successful applications. You will begin to see Birmingham's um, licence taxi fleet uh, becoming more compliant and cleaner, which can only have a positive impact on uh, on the city because they're obviously one of the, the biggest the biggest users of, of the city centre and, and do a lot of miles on our roads. Uh, next one, please, Gemma. Thank you. Um, so we've talked about the clean air zone and we've talked very specifically about what the clean air zone is here to do and, and when it will happen. But I wanted to just put that into a bit of context and some of these things you may have seen in the media, um, but it all fits together and I think it's important to, to talk about it. So Birmingham has a transport plan. The clean air zone is part of that. And the transport plan has four main uh, visions, big moves, it says on the screen. Um, and I'll just run through some of those because they fit quite they they fit quite nicely with what the clean air zone is trying to do. So there is a move to try and reallocate road space across the city away from private motor vehicles and to um, people who are walking or cycling and using public transport. So this can be in many formats, temporary uh, cycle lanes that have gone in as a response to COVID. Some of these will be made permanent. Uh, bus priority, bus gates, bus lanes where we're stopping private vehicles but enabling the movement of um, of buses um, and and other things on high streets so and my local high street they've removed on street parking and increased and used that space so people can walk and to enable social distancing but it's also in my opinion made the high street a nicer environment because you're, you're further away from some vehicles. The next one is to transform the city centre uh, and to, to increase pedestrianisation of the city centre, uh, again, to make it more accessible and keep repeating myself for people walking, cycling and using public transport. Um, the next one is to prioritise active travel in local neighbourhoods. So this is not just focused on the city centre, again, focusing on these short journeys that people may just, because it's convenient, just jump in the car one mile just to pop to the shop. We want to try and make it as pleasant and as um, convenient to walk that and to cycle that. So that's the implementation of things like low traffic neighbourhoods that have been introduced in a couple of wards across the city, in addition to cycle lanes and prioritisation of, of, of people walking and cycling. And then finally, to, to try and manage demand by, by using parking. So this involves removing um, all free parking within the clean air zone. Uh, well, just that Birmingham City Council controls, obviously, um, and introducing, as Jim has touched upon, uh, controlled parking zones in and around the zone, uh, in and around the clean air zone, to stop people from dumping vehicles on the edge, which has a detrimental impact on residents. Uh, and also, one element of this of the transport plan that has been talked about is the workplace parking levy, which has been very successful in 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 um, Nottingham, um, and that is being looked at as kind of a feasibility study, but is is not imminent. Um, so that covers the kind of the transport plan and the final slide, Gemma, please, um, just kind of wraps it all up really in terms of what um, the clean air zone is doing. It's acting as an enabler of change. So we already know from, from the taxi scheme that a lot of taxi drivers have already converted their, uh, have already upgraded their vehicles because they know this is coming. We know that fleet operators across the city are doing this. We know that National Express, all of their vehicles are now compliant or a vast majority of them are now compliant. Um, and it just to kind of set the context in terms of the wider climate emergency and the, and the councils uh, and the city's route to zero, but also to stress that this isn't just purely the responsibility of Birmingham City Council. 
Um, we all have a role to play in this as residents, as businesses, as, as a community. Um, but the clean air zone and some of the funding around the clean air zone is absolutely helping to enable that change in, in collaboration with, with par and partnerships. So we've purchased uh, 20 hydrogen buses, which will be run by National Express uh, and got hit the hit the roads, as it were, I think in, in 2022, ready for the Commonwealth Games. We're looking to purchase up to 50 electric hackney carriages because it's not easy to get a uh, an electric um, a low emission uh, hackney carriage. There's only one on the market and it's cost a significant amount of money. And then there's also a big program to install electric vehicle charging points across the city because we know at the moment that, that they're not sufficient. Um, so there's just to kind of wrap up and just show that it's not just about the clean air zone. There's there's a lot of other stuff going on and there is a vision for the city to make it cleaner, greener and to, to increase the amount of sustainable uh, uh, travel happening in the city. So that's the final slide. Um, just to sum up really that there's our website, please use it There's a wealth of information. Uh, on the front page there's three kind of main calls to action as it were, so to check your vehicle is absolutely the most critical thing to do and then if you do drive a non-compliant vehicle to look at whether you can have an exemption or whether you can uh, access any of the financial incentives. There's a whole range of case studies and information about what other businesses and other people have done to, to get ready for this. So I would encourage you to, to head to the website to sign up for the updates is absolutely critical because anything that we do uh, announcement wise, you'll be the first to hear via that newsletter. Um, so I'll stop talking for a moment uh, and we will just uh, pause to uh, if Gemma can, I'll take the questions um, and we will um, look to answer some of those questions for you. OK, what have we got? A um, uh, question about the slide deck. Yeah, sorry, I'm just going to close my curtains. Uh, question about the slide deck. Yes, absolutely. This uh, meeting is being recorded, um, so we will following this meeting anyone who has even registered but then maybe not been able to attend we will email you all with a recording of the webinar um, plus a whole host of other information so you'll have that there and we would encourage you please do share that with friends family colleagues that's what it's there for the whole point of these 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 um these sessions is to raise awareness about the clean air zone um so yes you will uh, if you miss the start don't worry So there's a question here is a good one um, about whether the euro standards of euro four and euro six uh, for petrol and diesel respectively will meet future air pollution requirements or will there need to be a change some year into the scheme? Um, what I would well, what I would say is that there is no change imminent. We haven't we're, we're, we're delayed with this scheme. Um, these these um, these limits are set by central government, so they're the same across all clean air zones. Um, but that's not to say that they won't change in the future. We don't have any plans to do that. We don't even know if if what we're about to do. We, well, we have no body of evidence yet because we haven't gone live, so we're not going to change anytime soon. But what I would point to is the the growing growing evidence. And there was a report this morning published by Asthma UK and the British Lung Foundation saying six and a half, I don't know, I haven't read it fully, but six million over 65s are in danger because they live in areas of higher air pollution and calling on the government to do more and client earth are calling on the government to do more. Um, so the way that our clean air zone is constructed, it will start as it is and it, and it will unlikely to change initially, but, but I think we have to be realistic. If it doesn't work and the air pollution is not changing, then it will be looked at and the government will come under increasing pressure to look at it. But at the moment, those Euro standards are standard standards nationally and there are no plans to change. Yeah, so this uh, person uh, T at 1221 is referencing the vehicle checker. Um, the vehicle checker has been live probably coming up to a year now. Um, and we are aware of some instances where um, Euro 6 vehicles that were registered before the September the 2015, so for those of you on the call who weren't aware of this, uh, most Euro 6 came from September 2015 onwards, but there were Euro 6 registered before that. The vehicle checker 
uses um, registration date as its main um, determinant. I'm not sure what the best word is there, but you know what I mean. Um, and some vehicles that are Euro 6 are being told that they will be subject to a charge. If this is the case for your vehicle, um, there is a very clear way to get this resolved. There is a form on the vehicle checker that will that gives you access to the DVLA and you may just need to have your vehicle record updated or get a certificate of conformity from the manufacturer. But to put it into context, um, it represents a very small percentage of the amount of vehicles um, that are being checked via that system. Obviously, if it is your vehicle, it is a, an inconvenience, but it can be resolved um, and 90, I don't know the exact, but it's in the high 90 percent percentile of results are correct. Yes, Neil, um, one of my absolute bugbears as well around idling. Um, we have um, idling is a difficult one. It is, it is technically illegal, but it requires enforcement. So um, I think Birmingham City Council's approach to the idling issue is more around um, behaviour change and awareness, because from my experience of somebody who asks parents to turn their engines off outside my daughter's school, a lot of people simply don't realise that what they're doing and, and that it's actually really detrimental and really harmful. Um, so Birmingham City Council have a, a behaviour change team that go out to schools and go out to workplaces and are trying to, so outside my daughter's school there is a, a banner saying please stop idling, um, but obviously it's not always um, respected um, and it's not just outside schools, it's outside train stations and everyone can be guilty of it. It's a really challenging one. It is absolutely a big issue. Um, and unfortunately, um, I don't think there's an easy answer to it. I think there needs to be enforcement and education, but it is definitely part of our um, air quality action plan to look at and to try and to try and improve. Um, anything done to stop cars parking in cycle lanes? Um, as a keen cyclist, <laughs> that's a bugbear that I also share. Um, I think the quality of what is installed should, if it is segregated, should hopefully stop people doing that. I'm aware of various cycle lanes that have been installed uh, historically and recently where this is an issue. What I would say is, um, is that action is being taken. I think one in particular in the Ladypool Road has been really badly abused by park uh, by people parking in it, and now they're looking at harder measures which will physically um, stop people parking in them. Um, so my advice on that would be to report that wherever you see it, because the more reports you have, the more you can action it. But absolutely, if we want people to walk and cycle, we need to ensure that pavements and, and the cycle lanes are kept clear. Clean air targets are based on nitrous oxide, not on CO2 emissions. Thank you. Apologies if we didn't make that clear in the, in the presentation. Yes, CO uh, is NO2 emissions, NOx, uh, nitrous oxide. There's a lot of concern about congestion and e extra pollution on the inner ring road as people skirt around the zone. What would you say to people living near the inner ring road to allay their concerns? Uh, it's absolutely a genuine concern. Um, before all of this, myself and Gemma used to go to ward meetings and often um, the ones where people had the most concerns were the, were the areas that were bound, uh, on the boundary of the zone. Um, so the control parking zones that Gemma has mentioned should hopefully allay some of that the ring road may see may see uh, higher traffic um, but what we are hoping to see and it won't happen overnight is that well there's a transition and we used to have a slide that kind of showed this so i think we should probably add it back in is that there's three main elements of what we want to have we want to reduce the, the amount of travel that is occurring and, and covid may may help with that the vehicles that absolutely have to travel well hopefully they will be cleaner so they may still be going around the ring ring road but hopefully they're emitting less and then finally we want to shift people away from private motor vehicles um, entirely and get them onto the public transport network and walking and cycling so that the, the zone will act as a kind of as a stick um, to, to do that to, to encourage those journeys to change um, so I, those concerns are genuine, but I do believe that there will be, uh, that it doesn't mean that, that, that those areas are going to suffer more con uh, congestion or, or, or worsening air quality.
but we also, and just to reiterate, we also have one of the most extensive air quality monitoring networks in the country, and that's been advanced with further money um, from the from the government. So we will be keeping an eye on this, and absolutely, if it, if there are hotspots, then that will be acted upon. Will you get a ping or on a phone or on a TomTom -tom when entering the zone? No, uh, not not from us or from the government. If if the um, if the Google Maps and if the SatNav people have the technology to do that, then that, that's up to them. We will not be doing that. Um, so there will be 300 signs um, around the zone, around the inside, on the on the approach, on the boundary. So you really shouldn't drive in without knowing. Um, and it is the driver's responsibility to to be aware that they have driven into the zone. You will not get a text message or or an email afterwards, but I'm uh, I'm sure we did touch on it. You will have a six, six you will have a 13 day window to pay, so you can pay in advance. So you know on Saturday you're going to go to the theatre or whatever when we're allowed to do those things again. You can pay six days in advance. If you forget. You can pay on the day and if you still forget you've then got a further six days but the responsibility will lie with you as the driver plans to create parking sites by the area area nearing the zone no quite the opposite really is to reduce the amount of parking um, in and around the zone because overall um, we don't want um, we don't want more cars parking on the edge of the zone because that has a detrimental impact on um, on residents around the zone. I'm not sure I understand the question at 12.28 of who do you report it to? Oh, sorry, um, this was back going about the cycle lanes. Um, that's a good question. Um, oh yeah, I will put it in the chat. If it is specifically about cycle lanes, the team that are rolling out the new cycle lanes and will be able to advise on the best way to um, do enforcement is connected at birmingham.gov.uk. So those they are the people who are um, responsible for the transport plan and delivering it. Taxi drivers do the most, are the best option. So the, the, the change around the Euro 6, so previously um, they, they could only access an EV hybrid, but following feedback from the industry, um, there is only one model of electric hackney carriage on the market. Um, and it's, I don't know the exact figure, but it's incredibly expensive. And I think there's also a demand issue. So a decision was taken to help convert those Euro 5 higher polluting diesel to help them convert those to, to, to Euro 6. But they can also do retrofit technology. So it's not to say that all the Hackney carriages will now um, be Euro 6 and still be diesel. There is still an increasing number of electric uh, taxis, Hackneys on the road and retrofitted ones. Um, so it's just to further um, give them another option. Will the electric vehicle charging network be ready? Um, not all of it, because I think there's 300 plus points, but yes, there will be um, points going in, focused in the zone, um, in the run up to the zone going live. Um, absolutely. I think there's another one just coming as there. BCC car parks will have less pressure. Um, yeah, you you will have to pay parking. There will be no free parking in the clean air zone um, and on Birmingham City Council on the street or in car parks once the zone goes live. So yes, you will still be expected to pay for your parking even if you've paid the clean air zone charge. Absolutely, yeah. So that's the end of the published ones at the moment. I'll just take a moment. Um, Okay, it doesn't look like there's any further questions coming through. We'll give it a couple of minutes, but um, what I would say is if you think of a question afterwards, um, 
hopefully our website will help you answer it. That's what it's there to do. But if you if it's very specific, maybe to your circumstances or an application for an exemption, um, then you can email us at cleanair at birmingham.gov.uk. That's managed by the whole team. Um, but what I would say is that we've done as much as possible to make that application process as easy as possible. So our terms and conditions are not the most interesting document in the world, but they're very clear. Um, and we've also written up a guidance document with screenshots so for how how you should apply. Um, thanks, Gemma. So, so Gemma's just published the um, the email and the links in the chat if you wanted to click straight through to them now while it's fresh in your mind. There's another one, Gemma. If your car is 2000 and petrol, will I get charged? Please go and use the vehicle checker. It sounds like that you may not because the uh, Euro 4 came in uh, in 2006 if it's petrol, but advice is the same as it is for everyone on the call. Please go and check your vehicle and use the vehicle checker. That is the definitive answer. Uh, and it's just important also to say, because we sometimes have queries about this, Gemma did touch upon it, um, but the vehicle checker may show that you are charged here in Birmingham, but not in Bath. That is simply because Bath is a different clean air zone and they're not charging private vehicles. In Bath, they're doing buses, taxis, HGVs, but not private citizens vehicles. So if you see an eight pound charge in Birmingham, but not in Bath, that is why it's not it's not a fault. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely agree. Um, uh, Neil has said less of a question, more of a comment. This is going to be painful, but it has to be done. Absolutely agree. This is not an easy thing to implement. Um, but when you go all the way back to those slides at the start, 900 deaths a year. Um, this is a public health emergency. Even before COVID, this was important, but now we're in the middle of a, a, a respiratory pandemic. Um, so yeah, I absolutely agree that it's not easy. And sometimes these conversations we have are, are challenging and some people will be detrimentally impacted by some of this, but, I'm, but um, it's the right thing to do and, and, and needs to be done. So, so thanks for that comment. OK, my clock says 12.37, so if by 12.38 we don't have any um, further questions, we'll end the call. So just to say thank you very much for taking the time, your lunch break, whatever this time is, um, to, to join us. I hope you found the session helpful. Just to reiterate, we will send round all the information afterwards. The website's there. Um, and yeah, just thanks for joining. I'll just go on mute. OK, well, thank you very much. I'll end the call now, but uh, yeah, thanks once again for joining and, and uh, take care. Oh, question, sorry. Yes, Satish, you will be able to pay online or over the phone. That will be managed um, by uh, .gov. It will be a, a government website um, and details of that will be released soon. Um, so yeah, absolutely, it will be online and, and over the phone. And as I said before, you have that 13 day window to pay. Um, and it will be it will be so at the moment the vehicle checker is hosted on dot gov um so you will just um it, I, I would hope it would be integrated and, it, and you'll be able to pay in the same way on the, from the same area of the of the website um well thank you for your um feedback and thank you for joining lissy um if that is it i will now end the call um Thank you very much and uh, do take care. Cheers. Thank you. Bye.